Yes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the new episode of All Things Tech. Uh, I'm one of the hosts, Mitko. With me is Shabazz. Hi, everyone. All right. And today we have a special guest, so Nenant, uh, who is joining us to go deeply into all the discussions in regards to Internet of Things, communities, everything was changing in our life. I mean, the last couple of months have been quite exciting for <laughs> all the geeks there. So hi, Nenant. Uh, hi, guys. Welcome. Uh, maybe we can start with the easy question. So who are you? Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so I'm Nenad. I'm uh, currently working as a senior developer advocate at AWS, uh, and I'm focusing around IoT, as you might have noticed. <laughs> uh, so yeah, but uh, in general, I moved to Berlin in 2013, so it's going to be 10 years since I've been living in Berlin. And you mentioned communities, so that's kind of the the thing is here in Berlin, there is quite a lot of diversity of like. Uh, communities. So yeah, I got influenced by that. But apart from this, my professional background is uh, mechatronics engineer. Mm -hmm. So that's, I have a degree in that. So I started like mechanical engineering, did a lot of uh, yes. physics, thermodynamics, all that stuff. And then I realized, okay, um, you know, where the <laughs> world is heading is like, there will be parts for mechanical engineering, but there will also be electronics and informatics as well. So I kind of major in, in this area. And I was lucky to actually start as a like a embedded systems engineer and embedded software developer mm -hmm. working in like different industries. So industrial, uh, automotive as well, uh, consumer electronics and so forth. Uh, but yeah, and I think this was like, what was it? Uh, 2008. So it's quite, uh, you know, uh, far away. Uh, but then I think IoT was kind of like a, maybe coined by then, and then it was starting to get uh, popular. Uh, but yeah, um, I, I, I did this kind of like IoT, even though I, even at that point of time, it was maybe not called as such. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what I've been doing in the so past 15 I, years. <laughs> <laughs> so I met you fresh in Berlin, like uh, I've met you, I think 2014 when you've been working at Relay R, so it was just after you moved in the city. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I think it was uh, 2015. Uh, it could be 15. Yeah, yeah. yeah 2015. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Berlin's a lot of fun. I, I mean, miss not visiting there anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, one of the things uh, can, when kind of we... I started working at Berlin. Uh, I was working at a company called Open Synergy, and... We can come back to that company because I interviewed them uh, uh, basically on the embedded world. We had this kind of like podcast as well. You guys are familiar with. Uh, so yeah, we I had some colleagues from there coming in into our show as well. But um, I, yeah, I was starting there. And then at that point of time, the company was like 40 people or so. And out of those 40 people, we had like 20 something nationalities. So different okay. languages, different culture. And the most interesting part about this was kind of like, going out on lunch and then talking about all these cultures and everything. So that's where, you know, I realized like, oh yeah, every person alive has unique experiences, unique kind of uh, things that can bring to the table. And that is really important. And we can come into back into this, like how that relates to IoT and all that stuff. But yeah, this is something that I love about Berlin and where I'm at at the moment. You've done a ton of um, uh, interesting stuff like, you know, embedded development, uh, you know, industrial systems and like based on like your, all of that and plus your me me mechanical engineering background and now your IoT background, what do you think about this current, you know, industrial revolution pretty much that's taking place now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> happening once again, like the technical revolution and technological yeah. revolution, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I mean, this is, it's amazing, um, especially now with like this launch of uh, this, uh, large language models uh, with like chat GPT and all that stuff. It's, uh, it's really interesting. But um, yeah, my, my perspective on this is like, you know, um, in order to kind of scale and, and move as a society, uh, we need that interdisciplinary work. So we need people from like different backgrounds uh, as well, kind of working together to build that engineering solution as well. Uh, and you know, having this kind of technology 
nowadays that allows you to express what you want and ask questions in like typical way, like using language and get technical results out of it. It's amazing. It's like, I, this is once in a lifetime opportunity, right? It's like, we're just living, uh, you know, and scratching like how the future might look like. So I'm, I'm super happy about like what's going to happen. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. How do you feel? But yeah. I, I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> it's super exciting. And you're absolutely right that this uh, need for multiple disciplines means there's something for everyone pretty much. So, you know, whether you're a software developer, network engineer, whether you're good at prompt engineering, all of this is going to be you know, super, super <laughs> yeah, useful. But... <laughs> yeah you mentioned prompt engineering i mean this is just a one skill that can be trained quite quickly and then if you have other skills in terms of other engineering or whatever you have uh, this tool is going to amplify uh, those skills that, that's how i see it it's like you know you're going to be 10 times better at what you're doing uh with with this uh yeah I would say 100 times. 100 actually, times, yeah, there you go. Maybe 100 times. <laughs> I'm thinking to change this headline on LinkedIn to prompt engineer because that's what they do now. Past yes. three months. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's so exciting. <laughs> no, yeah. I have the feeling the past three months I've learned more new stuff than the past three years. Like the past three years, nothing kind of big and evolutionary happened. I mean, there have been some good announcements, etc. But nothing compares to, let's say, all the launches that happened last week. Just one single week yeah. combined so much innovation. And But back to the Internet of Things, so, uh, what, what part actually do you see all these large language models that are playing in the Internet of Things in your daily work today? Yeah, I mean, if you think about this like IoT, and I think we talked about it many times, it's just an infrastructure. It's an infrastructure that stretches, you know, um, apart from the data center, it goes outside of it and then stretches to the devices. And then, you know, when you have this tooling like, uh, you know, machine learning or this uh, lar large language uh, models as well, it can advance a, an engineer that has an idea uh, that can, you know, uh, create some specific use cases that are outside of only the digital world, which like, you know, we see like using screen and a mouse. And um, yeah, so what, we, what, what you said, like 100 times uh, faster in, in a sense that now you can, um, you know, have an idea, you can have a partner, which is ChatGPT or any other tools that are out there uh, that you can work together closely to you know get that idea and deploy it um you know and create that kind of like iter prototype but also scale it right and that's where this you know iot and the infrastructure uh comes into place if you have the right infrastructure to allow you to deploy those small business logic or applications whatever you want to call it to the constrained device to the edge or the cloud as well mm -hmm. then you know it uh again it makes this kind of thing um, much faster to uh, showcase to potential customers or whoever you want and then get feedback and then improve much faster as well. So, you know, that's why I'm saying is like in the next couple of years, we're going to see an explosion of new things happening. As you said, in like three months, things have happened that have not <laughs> happened in the past three years. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I never wake up the past three years at 6 a.m., just to finalize something I was working on until 2 a.m. the night before. And this is happening now, which is like, what? <laughs> and, and like, you know, I have three kids and wife, which are not yes. happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You can guess. And yes. the cat, the cat is not happy. Like, what's the <laughs> guy doing? <laughs> Why the screens are on? <laughs> no, I completely get it. It's like yeah. you get that kind of like child sense of like and being enthusiastic and you want to finish yes. things and so forth like yeah i can imagine that it's amazing you can't stop <laughs> <laughs> um, i had a question uh, regarding um you know iot and what could, could you explain why workloads or orchestrating workloads is so important for iot like where is that important important for example in the edge um what things especially with ai now you know when we're doing training or inference 
and you've got to have the workloads in different areas. So how how um, how important is that for IoT and where's it going? Yeah, yeah, no. So this is an excellent question, and um, it's kind of interesting. I think uh, Mitko, we did talk about this briefly, but it, so you know, when when you have um, this kind of like infrastructure, as I mentioned, uh, and if you look at different verticals like automotive, industrial, consumer, and whatever not, um, it all comes to like you know uh, a certain autonomy of an IoT project. And I'll come back to this orchestration workload. But like you have some sensors, you have some actuators, and then you have like either a constrained device or you have like an edge device. Mm -hmm. And then it, this device kind of uh, ingests the data from the sensors. And then you have some kind of message bus that goes across uh, the constrained device and edge and the cloud. And then you might have some applications that basically operate on this data on a constrained device because it's closest to the sensors, you need to act quite quickly. So you have like small applications that do something with this data and then either put this data back into this kind of data bus or kind of routes it back to the actuators, right? And then you have this kind of like across the chain as well. So you have like bigger uh, workloads, for example, on the edge that aggregate the data of like multiple constrained devices or multiple sensors. And then again, this goes into the bus, they, they operate on this data, put it back and so forth. And then, you know, you have the cloud, which is like a big, slow process, but gets data from like multiple devices and all that stuff, right? And then if you think about from that perspective or that anatomy of like an IoT, um, the main thing is like the, the, what brings value to all that chain is uh, those applications, those small applications that can be put on like a constrained devices, like something that is like running on a microcontroller does not have the memory management unit or something that's running on like Linux and, and so forth and something in the cloud as well. Uh, you have different developer personas that are, you know, deploying uh, or actually developing first those applications. And then they need to be capable of deploying them across all that chain, across all that infrastructure. And, uh, you know, if you don't have that orchestrated, then it becomes really chaotic and then it slows you down into like putting innovation and uh, you know doing fast iterations as well right mm -hmm. so that's why you know having that infrastructure and then having the right orchestrator uh to you know deploy those small applications or bigger applications whatever that is even as you said like ml um ml models so you know you need to deploy them and there is an application that you know, loads the model, ingests the data, does the inference, and makes some, create some insights uh, out of this, right? So that's, I mean, that's how I see it. That's how what, what I think is kind of like important uh, to have the right, um, you know, orchestrator for, for all of those workloads, no matter what they are. Uh, and we don't, we have those orchestrators in the cloud. Mm -hmm. We have been using them for quite a while now. Um, you know, Kubernetes is one of the most famous one. I know Mitko has this saying, like, if the, if the question is IoT, <laughs> Kubernetes is the answer. So I know what you're going to say. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, we need something that stretches across all of this. So. I, I mean, I remember like AWS was way ahead of its time with um, uh, Greengrass, Mitko. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, we, we, we were using it in our startup in 2017 because there was nothing else on the market. So yeah we've been using it <laughs> yeah that i think we used it when it was basically version 1.0 <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah it's uh, quite interesting yeah things yeah. have been changed uh, quite a lot now and um yeah they, they, i mean still uh it's it's an evolving technology uh but yeah uh it's it's yeah. an interesting it's an interesting yeah concept there definitely but the edge is becoming stronger and stronger. Today, if you want to get like a, I don't know, a temperature sensor, you're getting a four core CPU, like MCU. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can get like a Raspberry Pi and then, yeah, it's like you have, you have a couple Raspberry of uh, yeah. CPUs there you can work with, right? <laughs> yeah, so, so that, that's the question. I mean, are we in that phase where you can actually go really distributed with edge computing and yes. distributing these workloads plus the data? Yes. So you can run fully autonomous without the cloud. I mean, are we in that point or it's still science fiction? So I had a lot of conversation uh, 
on the embedded world, but even before that, and I think we even had like a podcast about software, software defined vehicles. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is like, there is a quite big movement to abstract almost everything to be in software because of like what I mentioned earlier, like fast iterations, all that yeah. stuff. And I mean, if you also look at the pool of engineers that are writing like high level languages compared to the pool of engineers that are proficient in like C, uh, you know, and embedded systems, it's like those are people are dying out and you have like a lot of uh, people who are willing to kind of, you know, develop their application in high level languages. But uh, what they're moving, moving is completely into this kind of like software defined vehicle. And it kind of interesting, the trend is also going into this like software defined automation as well in the mm -hmm. industrial environment. And there um, we seen this kind of like what you're saying is like, for example, things like K3S uh, coming into and, you know, being uh, popular. We had, um, you know, a couple of projects, uh, public reference now that are uh, at AWS, of course, that are kind of like having uh, K3S um, with like green grass and, you know, having this kind of IOT interactions as well. But what I've been hearing in the past couple of months, six months now, coming from the embedded uh, system engineers mm -hmm. is that even at this stage, how they used to work, uh, like something like Kubernetes is, is too much for them. Okay. And if you look at like how they have this in, in, in car is usually nowadays, I mean, they started using hypervisors. So typically like in a car, you will have a uh, multiple ECUs or ele electronic con control units, uh, which have um, SOCs that have like a hardware virtualization as well, like what you have in the data centers. And what they started doing this in the past couple of years is that they have on a single SOC, multiple VMs and multiple partitions. So they can have on a one SOC run like a Android um, operating system that is for their infotainment and whatever, uh, and the instrument cluster, then they have one partition that's basically telematics unit and whatnot. So basically have that on one SOC, but now with what you're saying is like multi-core, multi-SOC environment, yes. they started having, because some SOCs are good at processing, processing and crunching data, but then some of them coming from NVIDIA, they have like certain GPUs and we've seen like uh, NVIDIA Jetson uh, Nano and that kind of um, boards as well. So what they started having is like multi SOC environment with multiple uh, VMs or partitions, how they call them, right? Where you also have like Autozar and bare metal applications running. So they dedicate a complete core. They have to go through this kind of like safety critical, all that stuff. And uh, they were saying like, you know, we were trying to bring this uh, K3S in, in a couple of occasions and they were saying like, yeah, it's, it's fine, but there are so many moving parts and, you know, having, uh, you cannot orchestrate, you can, it cannot orchestrate VMs. It cannot orchestrate um, virtual machine. Yeah, virtual machine. We cannot orchestrate yes. just uh, containers. <laughs> uh, and we also want to orchestrate some of the processes like running processes and even, you know, maybe Java or something like that. And then for that reason, um, there is a, actually a prototype. I'm doing this prototype right now. And uh, there was something that uh, we were presenting uh, on Embedded World um, as well, kind of using Nomad as a orchestrator because it comes as a single binary and it's able mm -hmm. to orchestrate uh, multiple of those types of workloads, not only containers. And then also what I wanted to point out is like, um, AWS is also part of the automotive grade Linux as a steering committee. And we also get to work with a lot of those automakers. And one of their requirements is like, oh, um, Docker is like from a security perspective and uh, how it's evolving, not so great for us. We want to use LXC, right? And in that okay. scenarios, again, um, uh, Nomad kind of fits the bill better uh, as well. So again, um, maybe I give you a, a, a long answer, but I want to paint a picture of like, uh, how things are evolving. Uh, so there is still, you know, room that we need to explore. Maybe Nomad is not the right solution. Maybe we need to rewrite all of this. Maybe we need to get something that's like still like Podman, for example, that's mm -hmm. a good tool. It accepts, uh, you know, cube CTL kind of uh, format. 
compared to like Nomad, it has its own HCL uh, specific language from uh, HashiCorp, right? So yeah, uh, that's kind of the direction in the past six months at least that I'm seeing and kind of like prototyping and reflecting back uh, to the community. Okay, and maybe you can share a little bit more around Nomad because I think a lot of the listeners have, don't know the project. Yeah, so it's from HashiCorp. Um, mm -hmm. It's from HashiCorp. So they have this kind of like Terraform uh, console and Vault and all the other tooling. And uh, they have Nomad, which is used to orchestrate workloads more or less. Um, yeah, it, it started, uh, I don't know, it started like a couple of years back. Okay. I think it's now at 1.5 version. Uh, but yeah, the good thing about it compared to like K3S as well, I mean, in this scenario as well, is that it comes as a single binary. Okay. And you can, so you you just, when you're, you have to think from the embedded system engineer perspective, like what they want is they want to build a image that contains bootloader, Linux kernel, user space, and, you know, just, you know, have it on the devices and that's it. They don't want to touch any other parts of the system. And in that scenario, like adding just another binary into the overall picture makes more sense to them. And then now the question is like, how does that uh, create like a cl cluster? How do you create a cluster of those multiple SOCs or multiple ECUs is that when you, when you start the Nomad process, there is an a file that basically a configuration file that says, okay, you will become a server and you will expect to have two more servers, uh, oh. you know, join okay. or whatever you want. That's and nice. then, you know, for the, for the clients, you just say, okay, you will be the client. And then of course you can put like a lot of metadata and whatever not. Um, and then you can say, okay, the servers will be living on this address. So you can provide like an IP address or you can just use the DNS, which is, Usually what people do is like just, you know, have the host name and that's it. And of course, the assumption is that, that you have all of that in the network as well. And then, you know, the clients join and then they, that's how they create a cluster. And then from that point on, it's kind of similar story to what you have with uh, uh, K3S, where you kind of send those deployment files uh, where, you know, the state, then the nomad will match the state and we will schedule those. There are different type of schedulers as well, uh, okay. like you would have with the K3S. Uh, as well so yeah <laughs> and do you have something like fox too like if you want to do GitOps, devops ml ops for nomad i mean what's, what's the approach i mean i did a i can we can share this afterwards <laughs> so i did a I, st I started like a small blog post where i have okay. uh green grass and then uh, i have uh more or less uh, a nomad kind of bootstrap in the cluster and then I have like a so-called system partition, which is like a partition that is uh, having, um, you know, all the system components and Greengrass and it has like the Nomad server as well. And then like the other clients uh, on the stack. And then the point of entry is through Greengrass. So what I'm doing is like Greengrass provides like this Greengrass development kit. And mm -hmm. there is a also a blog post that I wrote about how you can use this using like GitHub um, actions to have like that kind of like a GitOps um, okay. user experience where you have the state of applications that you want to be spread across the cluster. You define where and how they are needed to be spread. And then, you know, you just change something. You do git commit, git push, and then it ends up. And then there is like a deployment that, um, uh, you know, is picked up by Greengrass. And then that instructs Nomad kind of to to distribute that load. Um, I can I can share this. Uh, yeah, we can we can share it in the yeah. in the notes of the blog. Yeah, later. Yeah, so cool. this is one one way. Of course, um, <laughs> I I have no clue if this is going to be the right way. This is something again that you know we, we are I'm putting out to the community to get the feedback because I think that's the best way to kind of experience this. Um, and of course, HashiCorp they have their own way of doing with like Terraform, with console, with Vault, yes. uh, all that stuff. And that is perfect for the, when you're actually in the cloud in the data center. And, or even if you're thinking about like having a multi-cloud environment, this is kind of like the perfect uh, use case as well. 
Uh, but like, this is something that when it comes to spreading that across the edge, it's something that we are kind of prototyping and uh, looking at at the moment. Yeah, it's good that you're, it's good that you're putting this out uh, in a blog post because you're right about this whole interdisciplinary thing that you were talking about because some of these conversations uh, like, you know, clusters of contain, having container, containerization, what kind of containerization, uh, all of this kind of stuff, um, um, many, these are kind of the features that have been in enterprise architectures as well, uh, within networking as well, and the networking elements have, being able to do software defined networking. So this is um, yeah fascinating to think all of this is now being collapsed. So you're having like a, a data center within a vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and the requirements is like, I told you, and we have this kind of prototype as well that we're kind of working against is, you know, so a, a developer that is building an Android OS. So, you know, it's like for automotive, you need to build the Android for a specific target, right? And we have this experience. There was actually a demo um, on Embedded World as well, where they opened Cloud9, they... Uh, pushed a, you know, a, a changes into the Android, into like the whole Android operating system. It generated a new image, which contained the bootloader kernel mm -hmm. and, the, and the OS itself. And then that got distributed and scheduled in car and then ran. So, uh, I mean, the demo was switching from, uh, I think Android 11 to Android 12. Okay. But I mean, it can be anything, right? So, you know, uh, going through that cycle to have that scheduled uh, and then running in, in a car, it's like, you know, uh, amazing to see, like, you know, in one loop, more or less. <laughs> Over the Arab days, for cars are tough. I, I think <laughs> yes. only Tesla managed to do them because they started early and they have like a decade plus of experience. Exactly. All the others, yes, it works until you don't get the notice. Can you please drive the car to the, the nearest exactly, place? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> because we have a USB to plug in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. Uh, so is going to be there a full chat assistant running in the car, fully offline? What do you think? Like large language model on the SOC inside the vehicle? Yeah, I, I hope so. Okay. But I'm I'm just I'm just thinking about this look. You, you watch the movie Her, right? Uh, yes. You know the movie? Yeah. yeah. So I, <laughs> I'm really looking forward <laughs> to kind of that experience, even though, you know, I have no clue if, uh, you know, if this is going to put us more down or, or uh, excel us as a uh, species. I have no clue. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for that kind of experience where you have your own uh, chat assistant, and I think Mitko, you were building something recently. Yes. I saw it on LinkedIn. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you have your own, and you just bring it with you yeah. wherever you are, right? So no exactly. matter in the car. It knows but, uh, all your data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The thing that is kind of like puzzling right now is like this GDPR and like data protection and so forth. But uh, I think we will figure that out as as well. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, reading somewhere about how there could be a risk of. Um, with, with like trained models being actually able to extract out uh, information from that. Uh, so actually getting back to the original training data uh, yes. may, may, may be possible. So <laughs> it, it, it will be fun, but uh, in, indeed, I mean, now these models, they're becoming smaller and smaller, and now you can run them also inside the phone if you want to fully offline. I was listening to the podcast to uh, the guy who actually created this uh, Olama uh, C project and the Whisper C. So what, what he did, he went and he checked the, the GitHub repos and he saw everything is like this Python and like this super heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you want to run it, you need like this super expensive uh, Apple M2 Pro with 64 gigs of memory, etc. And at one point he said, okay, I'm a grown man. I, I, I write in C. <laughs> so he actually took all the code build everything in C and the last couple of weeks now everyone is actually running these large language models and whisper type of NLP agents on top of phones, Raspberry Pis or whatever people have. Yeah. So yeah, it's fascinating. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. yeah. 
even with this like you've seen this like alpaca model coming out with yes. like uh, from stanford like you know even even that it's like you know taking training the the model based on you know uh chat gpt kind of like or what was it uh yeah i think it was chat gpt uh, kind of uh, it, it, it's llama from meta and then alpaca is fine tuning of llama on 52000 additional parameters exactly yeah 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 exactly so that, that's what so basically they used so i mean in those scenarios you have to have like a human in the loop right and that's why uh i think open ai you know spent quite a lot of money Yes. to you know train uh and now they 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 just use the chat gpt as like a you know for fine tuning so which is i, I think it cost them like 600 dollars or something exactly uh, 600 to, bucks to the same level. <laughs> you no, know. It, not on the same level but if you are specific if you do let's say a chatbot in specific area like for chefs in the kitchen you can make it top obviously open ai they spent years and billions to go and do it very broadly and it, it yes. can discuss all the topics. It's really spooking the people who are outside of tech. <laughs> Whenever they say, oh, what's going on? This is artificial intelligence. And like, you know, it feels like this. You know, let me just uh, find it. it you know, it's it's funny because, like this. yeah, I, I also have. <laughs> <laughs> Robots <laughs> coming. <laughs> So I, I have some neighbors here and they know like I'm in the tech and they're like, hey, what's happening that we heard like, you know, AI is taking over and so on. it's like, okay, <laughs> it's not that even serious, my, but yeah. <laughs> even my taxi driver. So typically they discuss the politics and that nothing goes well in the country. And then like a week ago, hey, this GPT is amazing. And it's like, <laughs> okay, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, everyone's talking about it. I was um, talking... Uh, on, a, on a group I was telling a, a dentist <laughs> how <laughs> how generative AI could could be helpful and how AI in general may, maybe they could have like a mini dental assistant that goes around with people and he charges them a subscription right <laughs> advising them when when they're eating too many sugary things <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. it's amazing I think it's it just really goes amazing. everywhere <laughs> yeah exactly so um, with Go on, go on, Shabazz, sorry. <laughs> well, I was just uh, curious, like with this uh, expansion of AI and IoT technologies now pretty much commodity, right? Uh, well, the IoT, <laughs> lot, lots of the technologies there. What advice do you have for um, people who want to get into the field? Um, you know, whether they're like uh, in, just hobbyists and enthusiasts or whether they actually want to do it professionally for a, for a living and a, a career? Yeah, I mean, there is no better time to do it than now, right? So it's like you have a tutor that, you know, it can guide you through the, the whole process of like starting from, you know, not knowing anything about like IoT or software development or engineering in general. And then, you know, uh, going through this process and then having somebody to always to ask questions. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> there's no better time to do it than now. Uh, and same goes, and we, we touched base on this, same goes for people who are already uh, professionals in this field, right? They are um, now, what Mitko said, like 100 <laughs> times uh, <laughs> much uh, better, right? So I, there, was a, there was this tweet, I don't know who, who said it, but it's like there was a comparison. So, you know, beforehand, when you need to calculate... Um, you know, some, some big numbers, you had to do it manually. Like you had to go through all these calculations, but with the invention of a calculator, like you can just do this, uh, you know, uh, in the tip of your fingers. And uh, somebody says like, what calculator was for mathematics, uh, this uh, kind of uh, large language models are for language. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a tool uh, and you need to figure out how to use it properly, but then, you know, it's uh, sky's the limit, so. Um, I mean, in relation to IoT, this is what I was mentioning. If you have all of those um, interdisciplinary functions in terms of like, okay, writing um, a small C application that can run on like really constrained device, then you can start, you know, asking questions. Okay, I have this much memory. I have this kind of uh, 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 microcontroller 
um, what, what kind of suggestions you would uh, give me if I want to write in this type of application? Or, uh, and he will say, oh, use free RTOS or use like bare metal or just use Rust. And then, you know, you can say, okay, I have this uh, sensors, uh, like how do I connect them? And then you will say, yeah, you need that pin, that pin, whatever, uh, <laughs> just wire that up. And then, you know, you can just go through this and then even uh, developing uh, high level applications is like, okay, now I need a dashboard. Like, what do you suggest? Maybe, you know, use Grafana or like write something in React. Here's a, uh, you know, uh, a JavaScript uh, library that can plot nicely based on what you want. <laughs> all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's bringing all of these things together. I would say. As a developer, do you feel threatened by it? Like, what's your feeling, or you kind of like it? No, I mean this. <laughs> yeah, I'm quite enthusiastic <laughs> about it, right? Um, it's I. I mean, I don't. I think maybe if, uh, first first reaction from people is like, okay confusion and maybe mm -hmm. like okay trying to extrapolate uh from from this like what's going to happen i know we've we seen in the news like oh some of the professionals will uh, die out and so forth but that will leave room for people to do more creative work right at the mm -hmm. end of the day it's um it's uh, it's you know what talking about like diversity what what we mentioned uh, i'm here living in berlin uh, you know, you've seen a lot of uh, creative people. If they have a platform to express themselves, like what they want, uh, and have a tool that guides them through and actually express the uniqueness they have, no matter if that's code or engineering or crafting or whatever, then that's a good thing, right? It cannot be a bad thing. Um, and I mean, I was, I, I told you this before, like I, mm -hmm. I'm quite influenced by this uh, book from uh, Yuval Noah Harari, Homo Deus. Uh, where he talks about dataism. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this. Oh, yes. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, he, he talks about like, you know, how dataists kind of like talk about, uh, you know, human history can be summarized in like a couple of points. One point is like, um, create, like they can say, okay, humans, they're just processors, they process, inf for process information. And then if you increase like, we as humans, we were trying to increase the number of uh, different processors. So that's basically the culture, the diversity that we see right now. And then we were trying to increase the freedom of exchange. This is like the roads and everything that we have. Um, and you know, we have been going through that process. Uh, and I think this is like the next next big step in it as well. So yeah, um, I think good things will happen. Uh, there is no threat about it, right? I don't know what think about this. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, lots of people are really keen to and excited, um, like like we've just been giving the examples of, you know, everyone's interested in chat GPT right now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think they are excited to actually see you know, how how it's going to change their life, change their work, um, improve things like, uh, you know, getting the, all that extra productivity to, you know, be able to do more, uh, have a lot more value add. And you know, getting all your mundane stuff being done by uh, by the AI that's um, intriguing. Uh, also, the the things that you could you know never have done before. I mean, um, on, on a on a group, I was talking to another friend of mine who uh, was talk. He, he works for a news organization, and sometimes they need to find a location to do some filming for. You know, maybe maybe they need to find a, a location with a particular local government of a certain type with um, maybe a certain type of population and they want to go and they want to have a location also where they can park their vehicles and everything so that's something which may, may have taken hours to do in the past and now you can just frame that as a question and get the information and be actually spending the time getting real data right from from mm. the people out there <laughs> so uh, yeah it's, it's going to improve things dramatically uh, makes the life of assistant staffer also for juniors who are just getting into the job because I'm um, speaking with friends like VP of engineering and CTOs and now everyone is actually rethinking how they're going to actually structure the new development cycles and jobs. I mean, <laughs> because obviously in the past they had to put certain amount of junior mid senior to, to go and do the job specific on the size, let's say uh, L, M, XL. 
And now they're actually seriously starting to think that maybe the methodology needs to include also a lot of this um, kind of peer programming, which is AI, and they just gonna lower the amount of juniors, developers, QAs, etc. that they need. So that's gonna make the the job of a lot of kind of just finishing going out of university or uh, kind of young developers, I guess. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I mean, but then they get the opportunity to now work on the technology and use uh, this kind of tooling to advance themselves even further. So, yeah, I mean, the the issue that we are having right now, uh, apart from like this, the tool is released, is that we are about to go into this kind of recession or we are already mm -hmm. or like things are not economically the best uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, it, it, it is a troubling uh, no matter what, but again, yeah, with enough, enough time and uh, people uh, curiosity, I think, yeah, there will be uh, things booming uh, with, with things that we couldn't even imagine. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So while wow, that we went really into the Hamudeo space, let's go back to the, what we make money of today and like what people really focus on and, you know, it's it's March, and this is the month of Kubernetes for us. We decided, okay, let's dedicate one month to Kubernetes. Maybe for April, we have to think Shabazz for Nomad month. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but uh, we defined that it's a Kubernetes month before all these Gen AI happens. <laughs> so now we're going to be a month behind the whole world. But anyway, so since it's like the, this month, and, you know, there is this rolling joke, like if there is... If it's IoT, the question is IoT. The answer is obviously Kubernetes. So <laughs> you already spoke a lot, but uh, if we think about what's the role of Kubernetes and kind of having these satellite workers as microcontrollers mm -hmm. and having this much more distributed edge to edge communication, I mean, do, do you think people are interested into it? Because also Kubernetes is exposing a very robust control plane. And yes. now every big cloud provider like um, AWS with the Outposts, uh, uh, Azure with the Arc, uh, GCP with the Anthos, yeah. everyone's building these gigantic control planes and control planes agents, which are actually pulling in these small edge devices. I mean, small, small, <laughs> at least like four gigs if you want to run Kubernetes to become a cloud native pieces. Yeah. So, do you see like this picking up? Uh, is it like too scary for people to go and, and build it? Uh, is it too heavy for the infrastructure we have today? Like, what's your point of view? No, so definitely, the, I mean, I, I've seen it, uh, as you said, spreading across uh, the edge. Um, I mean, when it comes to like really constrained devices, um, I mean, there are a couple of projects, right, that are uh, kind of looking into this. It's like, you know, you have to create this kind of uh, custom resource definition. And then once you have that, you know, running, then it can uh, deploy or interact with your, um, you know, constrained devices, uh, however you like it. So that's, that's uh, something that, you know, uh, it's, it's pretty cool with this kind of having that extensibility of the uh, Kubernetes. So that, that is pretty cool. And then on the other side is like, people um, are readily finding resources on internet mm -hmm. on like how to use, like how to write kubectl files and then how to package their applications and so forth. So I think that on, on its own, it kind of spreading uh, this even to those workloads, what you said, like in the, and we've seen it in the industrial environments quite a lot uh, as well, right? So yeah, I, I, again, um, what I was mentioning earlier relates to uh, those kind of typical personas who are working still in the embedded context. Uh, we're still not having that much of resources and they need to be like really constrained. But if you have something like an outpost or like just a beefy uh, virtual machine in like an industrial context, uh, having that your cluster spread across is like a perfect solution. The, the only thing is, you know, once you, you, what you have to think about is, so there is a lot of um, communication uh, or bandwidth consumption. Uh, like if you really want to spread this so that you, your 
in, you have it like in your in the cloud, and then you use the same, um, you know, you kind of spread that cluster that goes to the edge as well, and and you kind of use the the, the control plane from the cloud. In those scenarios, you might have some kind of traffic o overload, especially if you're using like something like mesh networking, Istio or yes. Linkerd or that kind of stuff as well. Uh, which it might be coming handy if you know you are actually having some applications mm -hmm. needing to talk uh, with each other. Um, so in those those scenarios, you just need to be mindful about like this bandwidth consumption. But again, if if that's not an issue and you have a good connection, uh, then yeah, this is a pretty uh, interesting solution to level set everybody so that you know you can get that fast iterations of like new features, new software. Yeah. Uh, going through that kind of like GitOps so or whatever CI/CD pipelines you have. Yeah, and also WebAssembly. So actually today there is this Boazon IO, like yes. the first WebAssembly Tech Summit in Barcelona. And unfortunately, we are not there, but we have plenty of friends who actually went there. Nice. And I mean, I have seen demos where you have these uh, small microcontrollers running WebAssembly and, and then they become like a worker satellite nodes. So you have one big... K3 or K8, and then you're just placing these nodes and you're just pushing workloads and then you're getting the data and the results, That's which is cool. like, wow, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. this is this is amazing. The, yeah, we've seen this as well. Uh, this is amazing, this kind of like having, you know, um, capability to actually write in Python or JavaScript or Rust or C and then at the end, using LLVM, have the WebAssembly, and then basically have that WebAssembly running across the stack. It's also something that we're definitely going to see more, yeah, uh, for yeah. sure. I'm I'm actually keen to see um, containers being used more with the uh, microcontrollers because, um, you know, it's very important sometimes to be able to rapidly create your user interface. Um, you know, using a, a simpler language, maybe Python, something like that, to to create that, and have your C code doing your your communication with your um, peripherals and all of that, and combining the two of them together, that kind of thing would be you know super interesting to do with containers on microcontrollers. Whereas today, um, I mean, I I, I tried um, doing that with MicroPython, for example, because it would be yeah. quite nice to to do that and it's quite difficult i mean you can you can push off algorithms to see uh, as long as they're not actually controlling io <laughs> so that's like one you know one technique but i think actually yeah having a, a decent method of de delivering applications um, that can run in containers on microcontrollers would be yeah, really really useful yeah, yeah i mean this wasm is the the closest thing because i mean at the end of the day like containers is like it relies on the Linux kernel and like the C name and like, you know, all that kind of stuff, uh, C groups and yeah. Um, so the, I, I would say Vasm is the closest thing that can, can, can be uh, that you can run on microcontrollers. Uh, so hopefully yeah. that develops further. Yeah, I had to do technical due diligence for one investment and I found 22 startups actually building microservices for wasm today <laughs> and, and these are only the ones that look on the western world i guess in china there are another 220 who are building it yeah. so definitely people are now looking what's after kubernetes yes obviously now it's on the peak people are starting to adopt it but as we spoke complexity you cannot run this heavy kind of orchestration plane on devices can battery powered or mm. <laughs> kind of microcontrollers. Yeah. So it becomes like a really interesting time. Yes. <laughs> Curious to see what uh, kind of emerges and then sets the standards. Yeah. I mean, the things that kind of always win is the ones that have the best um, user experience or the APIs. So like, if you look at Docker, I mean, coming back to like this, uh, the, the technology was there with like, C groups, you can kind of create that uh, kind of containerized environment. But what they did is like, they had like, okay, here is a file, which we call a Docker file. And you have a certain syntax. Like you just say, okay, uh, I need this, I need that. You, you can copy this from here and you can run it with this. 
And that's what they brought, like this um, user experience, user interface, the APIs more or less, uh, which kind of like scaled it further. So, you know, same now with like Wasm is that they, the technology is there, it's proven, it's been working in the mm -hmm. browser. Now they are figuring it out like, okay, this can actually work, you know, without the browser context. Um, so now we need to figure out like, what is the, what is the next Docker file or the next, um, you know, thing that allows developers to just, you know, package their things and make sure that they can consistently run no matter where they are. And I don't know if you've seen, but like on this event, Docker released um, their things called Docker in Wasm or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. I was looking <laughs> on the agenda. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. So I'm looking forward to see like what is going to uh, emerge as a kind of uh, easy to use thing, but still have the flexibility. Also, mm -hmm. well, it's quite good for web developers as well, right? I mean, the, the mm -hmm. new opportunities, new areas to expand because you know, obviously they'll yes. already be familiar with Wasm. And uh, it's like speaking of like developers, um, what what what's the interest in uh, generative AI and IoT? Uh, within developer communi communities, are they what kind of applications are they thinking of uh, that they could do today or, or in the future? I mean, in general, like the machine learning thing has been um, important for IoT. Uh, I think Mitko, you talked about this as well. It's like doing inference at the edge. Um, so yeah, no, where you need to in like you need to train. First of all, you need this data from if we were talking about the industrial context or automotive, doesn't matter. Uh, you would need to collect this data uh, from the sensors or, or already kind of uh, aggregated um, and then kind of train those models. And then, you know, you need that infrastructure to kind of um, create uh, and use something like o Onyx uh, and kind of like recompile mm -hmm. them to specific targets perhaps and to reduce that footprint. But, you know, in order to make sure uh, that you can do inference, uh, let's say to the, to the closest where you actually need to do some execution, you know, it's good to kind of put that as close as possible. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is something that, you know, uh, we've seen it's, it's not novel, so it has been happening for the past couple of years uh, as well. But then I'm wondering, yeah, what uh, what kind of other things now with this uh, expansion uh, is going to happen? I, I have no clue. <laughs> I think the most important part is to have that infrastructure ready uh, yeah. for you know whoever comes with new ideas, so they can add it. And uh, I mean, you've been on embedded world. I mean, something that we have missed with Shabazz and. I think when was the last time we went there? 2018, I think. Gosh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, About that yeah. Time. yeah. We've been room That's sharing because, <laughs> because I was doing my startup thing at that time, and Shabazz got invited. I think from Element 14 or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. So it was like really like a nice experience for everyone who is working with Embedded. I mean, that's definitely the the geek place to meet. So yes. like. What, what what did you miss this time? I mean, what was the wow thing for you? And like, what was the buzz all across the event? I mean, I, I suggest you watch the, like we did the live stream. So the, the you know, team IoT builders, we did mm -hmm. the, a live stream uh, three days, like nonstop talking to different people. <laughs> so I suggest you kind of watch that stuff. Um, but I think I mentioned it earlier, there is quite a lot of talk about this um, software defined vehicles. Okay. That is something that's like, everybody is now talking. The ARM is kind of also create, ARM created an initiative called SOFI, uh, which is basically bringing together um, multiple uh, companies kind of working together to lay out how that um, infrastructure might look like for the software defined, defined vehicles. Uh, that has been like a huge, huge topic. Um, then uh, battery charging, uh, like all things around uh, electrifying the vehicle and okay. uh, battery charging, uh, that stuff. Yeah, what else? Um, 
yeah, there was also a lot of discussions about IoT. I mean, what we already talked about, uh, you know, and how to uh, un un unblock and enable developers to, you know, um, cut their uh, development time and, and cycles. There was one discussion I actually had the last day uh, with Tyler. He's from Memfault. Uh, he was showing me his product. It's really cool. Uh, and it's targeting like constrained devices. Okay. Where he he wants he wants to have like similar experience that like when you're writing microservices uh, to have like on those small devices that you collect data, something like uh, open open tracing uh, uh, as well. So that you can have like a dashboard of all of those devices that whenever they are doing something like they are logging and shipping that data. And then they have like a dashboard where you can see uh, the communication logs. You can see like memory dumps if like uh, asserts okay. happen, wow. uh, exceptions, like all of that stuff. That was really, really interesting. I think going in this direction of observability, because the, as of now, like still for those constrained devices, there is no, let's say, um, de facto standard on how you would do observability. Everybody's doing their own stuff, right? And I really like this approach. It's kind of like open source uh, approach uh, as well. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah, and uh, and also one interesting thing that I really enjoyed again on that this, on this one of the days I think it was the second day discussion. Uh, so what guys from Open Synergy, uh, my former colleagues, were doing is like they were bringing the Vertio technology, so the technology that's been in the cloud for quite some time. They are now bringing it to the car. So what they do is, nice. yeah. So they have their own hypervisor. Uh, but like you can also use it with uh, any other hypervisor as well. Um, so you can, uh, there's this notion of like environmental parity. So what it means is like you develop your applications uh, in the cloud. So using like Graviton or, uh, you know, something that's already ARM. And um, more or less, uh, yeah, you kind of go through that cycle of development and so forth. And then uh, the hypervisor uh, has certain backends uh, of the actual driver, for example, for the touch, for the sound, for the GPU, for networking, for block devices, all that. And then once you deploy your, um, you know, uh, VMs, uh, more or less, that use it, uh, that enable the Vertio technology, then you don't need to change uh, the kernel and user space and whatever, the the same binary can run on top of that hypervisor nice. because it leverages this Vertio technology. And then, you know, um, you can kind of like deploy and start working in the cloud and then, you know, deploy to the edge, basically the same uh, the same kind of uh, binary, which is really interesting. I, I, like, I love that idea that right. they are bringing this to the car or, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean... Again, uh, a lot of interesting things. Um, <laughs> Any geek hardware that you really liked and was like, wow, when you saw it? To be quite honest, like, uh, no, not that much. I, I didn't notice too much, um, yeah, new things when it comes to hardware. I don't know, either I was too busy with like the, <laughs> the things that I was doing. Three days or maybe I missed it, <laughs> but I have not noticed it. Okay. The one thing, one thing that I really like, and I might be biased, uh, there was a launch of ExpressLink uh, from AWS, which is basically like a, it's a standard that others can implement. I don't know if you guys are familiar. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and Express, Expressive, Ublocks, and other implemented that allows you to connect to AWS IoT uh, from like any microcontroller, uh, just using 80 commands. So this is nice. uh, this is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I really I really like that project, and I had a badge. I, I think I have it here. Let me <laughs> yeah, I had a badge. Oh, here it is. That uh, yeah. So and I was wearing it like uh, where okay. It? Yeah, I see it. Nice. It's it's a. Yeah, so so this is this is the uh, the expressive uh, it's a Wi-Fi module, but the badge 
And we went through like, we went through the process of like, how you go about building this badge, like what goes into it. They use like circuit Python and all what Shabazz you were mentioning. Um, it has some sensors and whatever not. Uh, but yeah, this is one of the piece of uh, hardware that I really like because it builds on top of the kind of this express link, which is like easy module you put in and it has like a Raspberry Pi uh, Pico uh, as a microcontroller. Uh, so maybe you can see it. Oh, and then, <laughs> yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And then it's just use it circuit Python and then, um, you know, you can program uh, what you like and then also interface it through the cloud quite easily. Like there is no, you don't need to know about certificates uh, like MQTT, all that kind of stuff is like hidden away. You just do AT connect and it connects and then wow. you send and whatever. So <laughs> this is something Brilliant. that's interesting. Is that reference hardware available from Amazon or what else? No, so I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. So this is, uh, it's an open source. I can send that link as well. Uh, and you can just order it, uh, but not the assembled. So you can just order, like there are Gerber files and everything. And I think, nice. yeah, and I think they're building this for reInvent, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to have like, so you can buy it or something like that. Okay, so on, on our next episode, we also have Eric, the CEO of Seed Studio. So maybe we mm -hmm. can <laughs> tell him like, that's a good idea. Go and build like uh, 1 million of these. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Well, looking forward to that discussion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's going to be fun. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so I think that's that's uh, more or less. I, I, I wasn't active as I was before, uh, like... 2022 was my previous year uh, okay. because I was like the whole day like streaming. Uh, but yeah, uh, bits and pieces that I saw are kind of like going in these directions. Yeah, I, I don't think people realize just how much hard work it is actually being there and, you know, talking to customers and you know, being manning the booths and everything like that. That's a, it's a lot of work and you don't get a chance to see much of everything else. Yeah, while you're doing that. <laughs> yeah definitely. <laughs> So, Shavas, more questions to our guest? Uh, no, yeah, I'm just, just uh, yeah, just mainly, um, uh, yeah, I, I too was excited about um, hearing about Embedded World, and uh, I was curious. Um, did you did you think that uh, was there anything unexpected? Uh, like, was Embedded World very different from uh, the previous years simply because of this uh, transition to uh, you know these AI technologies that, that's occurring right now? No, so uh, to be quite honest, like I think you know, it's embedded world. In order to have a boot and then have your what you're presenting, you know, you need to plan it like, you know, hardware like more than six months before. And I think like this uh, thing with um, uh, ChatGPT hit in December, and it has not yet reflected in the embedded world. So there weren't many things about AI uh, there, uh, so yeah. But um, I'm hoping to see uh, things coming up next year. <laughs> but interestingly enough, this year uh, was much better in terms of uh, participation than the 2022. Um, yeah, there were more people uh, like, yeah, I think the, the conference was full, uh, like coming back to normal, I would say. Because this is the second one after the COVID. So the 2022 was immediately after, and it wasn't as full as it used to be. Well, that's a better experience. Last time was really tough 2018. You cannot find any place to go and eat. You can't find a place to drink. It was fully packed. Like, it's a small city. and becomes... Yes. <laughs> yeah, we had to reserve. Like, you had to reserve. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. there is no way. Yeah, back then I remember thinking this should be like uh, six monthly, not yearly, because there's just so much <laughs> to take on board. <laughs> and yeah, and think, is, think about now we have all these AI focused around text. Next year is going to be video. Oh. So just <laughs> yeah, I mean, you see the advancements and all the, the, I mean, runway V2, everything is ramping up in this speed. And as we spoke, we have the infrastructure. 
So technically we have unlimited compute. Now we have unlimited broadband, except in Germany. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> if you go outside of Germany, there is so much like 5G, there is lower orbit so communication, etc. So there is nothing actually that stops this kind of sublime metaverse type of experience yes. where you can get generative video, you can get the audio, you can get all these experiences and maxing out all the data all around. So next year is going to be definitely interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> cool. So something for the end, I mean, something, what you'd, would you tell to everyone uh, listening to our show? Like, what should they focus on this year? What should they do? I mean, you know, um, do whatever they are already doing, uh, but use the tools that they have now with the, this kind of like, you know, uh, generative AI and, and large language models uh, kind of to advance themselves. You know, and I think you mentioned this quite nicely is like, these are the times where you are preparing yourself uh, uh, kind of to for the for the future and kind of nail down on what's already working. So yeah, uh, continue with that. Yeah, hard times. Okay, so th thanks you, thank you, and uh, thanks to all, all our listen people listening. That was our episode with Nenad, and we went a lot in deep in everything around Internet of Things, communities, and home models. So a book that everyone should read. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>